Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Christina Anastasia, and I'm really pleased to be here to welcome you all to the seminar. Um, and I, before we start, I'd just like to do a bit of an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, and we also acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Now, for those online, we aren't quite clear if the um, webcam's working or not, but hopefully you're hearing us um, all loud and clear. So um, apologies if you can't see us. Uh, I'd like to, um, this morning, I'm actually pleased to be introducing the seminar that you're going to hear today about zinc on the edge, global controls on shale hosted zinc deposits, which is going to be presented by Dr. David Houston. Studies of three global sediment hosted zinc provinces, and that is in Mount Isa, Australia, Northern Cordillia can in Canada, USA, and the Irish Midlands, of course, in Ireland, indicate that deposits in all three provinces are associated with gradients in many geological parameters. These include lead isotopes, um, the depth of the lithosphere ascent. Okay, they've done this on purpose. Every time I do any presentations, they give me the big words and the hard ones. The um, asthenosphere boundary, upward continued gravity and magnetoluric data. These gradients are interpreted to mark major cratonic boundaries or edges that control the distribution of these deposits in space and in time. Studies of the Mount Isa province indicate that regional alteration has caused extensive loss of zinc, copper and cobalt, potentially providing more than sufficient metal for the known deposits. Moreover, in some cases, metal loss corresponds to changes in rock properties, possibly enabling regional mapping of zones of metal loss using geophysical data. Now, about our speaker, David Houston has been a research scientist here at Geoscience Australia since 1995. He is an economic geologist with expertise in the formation of zinc lead deposits, and he also has an interest in the relationship between tectonics, supercontinents and metal metallogeneuses. It all sounded really well in my head when I was practicing today, so apologies if I've now said them all wrong. But I would like to welcome the person of the hour today, and that is David. David, please come up on the stage. Thank you. All right, thank you, Christina. Um, so we might as well just get start straight into it. So I'm going to talk about zinc on the edge. And the idea is that the controls on zinc deposits or many zinc deposits are actually related to crustal edges. And I'm going to try and demonstrate that with a, a number of different data sets. Okay, Christine has already gone through the acknowledgement to country, so I won't reread that. However, I'd also like to acknowledge co my collaborators, okay? First and foremost, David Champion, who many of you would know. He's retired, but he's come back um, and is continuing his work um, on geochemistry. But also, I'd like to acknowledge the um, relationship we've had with the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, and that includes people from Geoscience Australia, including many in this, in this room, the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, Suzanne Perdi and Nathan Hayward, United States Geological Survey, Karen Kelly and Ann McCafferty, and also some other collaborators, and particularly Mark Hogart and George Gibson from ANU, Brian Ware, Svetlana Tesfalina from Curtin University, and Fred Richards from Harvard, and finally, Graham Carr from CSIRO. Okay, before I get into the talk, I wanna actually have some definitions. Now, I realize that there's a broad scope of knowledge probably uh, listening to the to, to this talk, so we need some definitions. Okay, I'm gonna be talking about stratiform shale hosted zinc lead deposits, and I'm not gonna talk about two types, siliciclastic carbonate and siliciclastic mafic. 
Now, these shale hosted deposits are exactly what they are shale hosted and they're parallel to bedding. Okay, now we can argue about exactly the timing and the, and the, and the genesis, but this is an observational characteristics. But I also like to consider the general characteristics of the host successions, and I've divided the deposit types into, into two based on that. First of all, siliciclastic carbonate. These are deposits that are hosted by successions which contain siliciclastic rocks, but also abundant carbonate rocks. Okay, and if you go to HYC in the Northern Territory, you actually find that the dominant rock type at HYC is actually a dolostone. Okay. In contrast, we have a different style of deposit, siliciclastic mafic, and these rocks are also hosted by siliciclastic dominated sequences, but in this case, they have coeval mafic magnetism. And a good example of this would be Broken Hill, which has mafic um, intrusions up to the stratigraphic position of the, of the ore deposits. Some other definitions, I'm going to talk about lead isotopes, and these are basically the different isotopes of lead and the ratios. And we usually determine these using samples of ore. So lead rich ore, you get galena, you actually analyze it for your lead isotope ratios. And from that, we can actually determine the characteristic of the, the lead isotope ratios of the lead source at the time of mineralization. And the lead source is what you've leached to, to dissolve lead and put it in the ore deposit. So that's actually what we're looking at. So we're actually looking at the upper crustal character of lead. And then we're going to actually calculate some parameters, particularly a parameter called mu, Greek mu, which is the uranium 238 on lead 204 ratio. And this, at, and this is at the time of mineralization because we're talking about initial ratios. This reflects crustal character. Okay, if you have a low mu, it indicates a juvenile character. If you have a higher mu, it in, indicates an evolved um, character of the crust. Another thing I'm going to be talking about is the lithospheric asthenospheric boundary. Um, and you might ask what that is, and I'm going to talk about LAB from now on because lithospheric asthenospheric boundary is quite a, a mouthful. Um, so what is the L LAB? Well, it's a transition between the rigid lithosphere and the ductile asthenosphere. Okay, so basically it's when it becomes a bit squishy down, way down below us. It's controlled by temperature, pressure, and composition, but mostly by temperature. So how do you determine this? And we determine this be using a combination of geochemical and also geophysical data, but mostly geophysical data. And so what the diagram you see on, um, on the left is a diagram showing the um, thermal gradient going down through the crust at a particular time uh, at the Ellendale um, diamond deposit, which I think is in, in Western Australia. And what they've done is they've actually calculated some points on that um, temperature gradient using data from uh, inclusions brought up from the asthenosphere and the mantle in the diamond pipes. And they actually can constrain that, um, uh, that temperature gradient, as you can see here. Okay, so it actually turns out you can do this using um, uh, seismic data. You can actually measure the velocity of the S wave. And this diagram shows the velocity of the S wave at a, at a various depth uh, around Australia. And it turns out that the LAB is actually a function of the velocity of the S wave. And you can see that relationship there. So at 1200 degrees, which is where we think the lithosphere becomes squishy, at 1200 degrees, that actually corresponds to a specific velocity. And you can actually use that to map the depth of the lithospheric asthenospheric boundary. And I apologize to all the geophysicists in, 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 in the room because I probably met, messed that one up. Anyway, we'll move on to some other geophysical data. And this is potential field data and upward continuation. Okay, so what is an upward continuation? So basically what you do is you take your data, which you gather on or near the, the surface of the thing, and then you use an algorithm, a mathematical al algorithm, and imagine that the um, data was collected at a higher level. And you can actually calculate what the data should look like at that higher level, and that's called upward continuing. 
And so if you upward continuing something 30, 30 kilometers, you've actually taken that data and you've upward continued. So you're looking at what it looks like at 30 kilometers above the surface. Okay, it highlights the deeper sources and or sources with a higher, uh, longer wavelengths and will actually tend to remove surface noise. And as you can see in the diagram, this just illustrates this. So, um, I don't have a mouse. Anyway, so on, on, on the diagram at the bottom, you see the, um, the actual ge um, geological cross section showing two sources, one at uh, that extends to depth and one which is, is shallow and, and is very restricted in depth. Then you above that, you have the um, measured uh, values. So this would be aero air magnetic data and you're looking at the total magnetic intensity. And then what you do is you do this upward continuation process and what happens it smooths out and as you move further up you actually start to lose the um, left um, body and it becomes very smooth and so you can only see um, the, the the main body so this is what you're up what you do with your upward continuing continuing you're actually removing the surface noise and you're also enhancing um, the deeper um, bodies the next thing I'm going to talk about is magnetotellurics, and this is um, courtesy of Jing Ming. And what you have is lightning, solar flares, et cetera, et cetera, and they actually interact with the Earth's atmosphere, uh, uh, magnetic field, and they actually cause perturbations in that magne magnetic field. And so what you do is you take out an instrument, you sit it going for about three months, and it records all of these things and the, and the, the resulting magnetic field changes. And then it actually will actually calculate the electrical conductivity profile with depth. Okay, so it tells you how conductive the crust is and even the mantle is with depth. And so these are three of the main data sets that I'm going to be talking about. So this is basically the, the end of the slide, but I'm going to, I'm going to put, put it out. And so what we're actually looking at is measuring the differences between continental crust and attenuated continental crust, oceanic crust. And we're actually using the data that we've got, the MT data, the uh, lead isotope data, the LAB data, to actually measure the differences between that. We're also looking down at depth, and so we're looking at the change in the depths of the LAB that you can see down here. So you've got the, the light blue to the darker blue. You've got the, that shows the um, LAB, the lithospheric sinuspheric boundary, and you can actually see looking at the changes in that. So we're actually looking at gradients. We're looking at gradients in geophysical data sets. We're looking at gradients in geochemical data sets. So this is what it started out with for me and, and Dave Champion uh, about 15 years ago. We actually did some lead isotope mapping of the North Australia Craton. And this just shows you the distribution of mu. It's calculated with a particular uh, lead isotope model. And so it's, you, you compare all that within that lead isotope model and you can see some patterns here. Okay, on the Western side, you go from low mu to higher mu, which indicates you're going from less evolved to more evolved crust. So the Kimberley is more evolved than the Tanami. If you go down the South, you can see actually a gradient from higher mu to lower mu, which actually indicates you're going to more juvenile crust. And that's probably because you're looking at a convergent margin along the Southern margin of, of the North Australia Craton. The interesting thing over here is in Mount Isa, you actually go from more evolved crust to more juvenile crust. And that's the area that we're gonna be talking about for the next 15 minutes. Okay, so that's where we're gonna look at. Now, this was data that we had 15 years ago. Um, since then, we've actually got more data, courtesy uh, largely from CSIRO and their huge database um, for the north uh, to the, uh, northwest Queensland, um, and also some data that we collect ourselves. So we're going to actually look at that area in that box, and here's the, the geology. Um, I'm not going to go into through this in the detail, but just to make a few points. Okay, first of all, we're looking at the North Australian zinc belt, and it has an endowment of 100 million tons of zinc, about 70 million tons of lead, and, and significant copper endowment. Okay, this is the largest zinc province in the world. 
Okay, there are two types of zinc deposits. As I mentioned before, we have the siliciclastic or the broken hill type deposits, and these are the darker blue circles on the map. And then also the siliciclastic carbonate or the Mount Isa type deposits. These are the circles in the blue. If you look at the major light blue dots, the Mount Isa deposits, they tend to plot on a north northwest to northwest trend shown in the, in the blue line there that you can see. And they also have a spacing of about 130 kilometers. Because that's the characteristics of what we see in, the, in, in regionally. And the other thing is that this trend cuts the geological trend. It also cuts the geophysical trend. Okay, so what's controlling this trend? And that's what we're trying to, 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 to answer the question as and, and provide some evidence of that. But before we do that, we want to just look at the, the context of the, the basin which hosts these deposits. And this is a diagram from um, Peter Southgate. And it just illustrates the interpreted um, facies architecture of the basin. Okay, so what you have um, at the base, shown in that squiggly line and then, and then the continuous line uh, further to the right, is what's called the gun and conformity. And that's actually the the boundary between the basements, which is shown in white, and the actual basin that we're interested in. Okay, in the um, east, which is shown in the in the dark gray, we have um, a basin, which is a deep water siliciclastic dominated turbididic basin. Okay, it has some mafic intrusions within it and some basaltic intrusions. Okay, this is where the um, uh, siliciclastic mafic type deposits, example is, uh, is Cannington or, or Pegmont occur in. These things are slightly older than the rest of the deposits. But if you go above that unconformity, you actually go into what's called the sag, uh, sag phase of the basin. And that's where all the rest of the deposits are occurring in. And they occur in various parts of that sag phases in various uh, uh, phases within that basin. And we're trying to understand the controls on this. Okay, so now we actually go and we look at the detail, and this is the exact same diagram or the same space that we showed in, in the geological uh, map, and it shows the, the distribution of lead isotopes. And this is one of the few sort of eye-opening uh, moments I've had when this thing first came up on Dave Champion's screen. And you can see there, there's a gradient, okay? There's a gradient from uh, the browns and, and, the, and the purples towards the yellows and the greens from uh, southwest to northeast. Okay, so that boundary, that gradient is actually quite interesting. We were quite surprised. And then what we did was we put the locations of the deposits on there. And you can see that the deposits actually line up with that boundary, with that gradient. Okay, so that says, oh, okay, so I'm just controlling it here. And you can see that line there corresponds reasonably well to that gradient in, in the lead isotope mu values. And it turns out that it's more evolved to the southwest and more juvenile towards the northeast. So you're looking at different crustal character between the two air to the regions and the deposits are occurring right along the boundary um, between those two different areas of, of crustal character. So we looked at this data and then it started the juices going and Corral came up with the idea, well, let's look at the lithospheric acenophysic boundary, the LAB. And this diagram is some work that he and Mark Hogart did at ANU, um, looking at the lithospheric acenospheric boundary. There are a few other people involved in, including me. And anyway, you can see that the deposits, which are shown in the um, circles of various colors are actually strongly associated with the white area, which is actually an intermediate value of the lithospheric acenospheric boundary. So we're actually seeing, again, a, an association of these deposits with a gradient. In this case, a geophysical gradient at many, many hundreds of, uh, at hundreds of kilometers of depth in, into the uh, Earth's interior. So we're looking at something at the surface, we're something, looking at somewhere uh, well and deep. Now we'll actually look at the intermediate areas. Okay, and you can see the same line. And Mark and Crawl uh, actually looked at the distribution of these sediment host deposits around the world. And you can see that many of the deposits are actually associated with the changes from the, the blues to the reds. 
And there's actually a very good statistical correlation between that. So there's some something fundamental which is controlling the distribution, which is expressing itself in the depth of the spheric to semispheric boundary. We'll look at a little bit more detail on Mount Isa. So what we did was we took the gravity data and we upward continued it to 30 kilometers. It actually also, we did it at 15 and 100 kilometers, but 30 kilometers worked the best. It worked okay for the other ones. And you can see that the deposits are associated with a gradient in the gravity image. Okay, and you can see the same uh, line that we had before. And as I said, the same relationship is seen in the 15, 50, and 100 kilometer upward continued images. But interesting, if you go back to 19, uh, 2000, a paper by Bruce Hobbs in a very obscure um, journal put out by the CSIRO, he actually talked about the relationship between these deposits and gravity worms, which are actually calculated from upward continued um, gravity data. You're looking at the um, horizontal gradients, which is exactly what we're looking at here. So you can see the data in the, in the gravity worms. You can see it in the upward continued gravity data. And that's what we're seeing. We're, some, we're seeing some sort of an edge in the gravity data. Okay, if you actually take that and you look at it in more detail, you can actually start to, to make a geological model based on that. And this is looking at the fundamental structures associated with the formation of this zone. So you can see um, the Kwame Fountain Range Fault, which is actually a known fault, which is mapped on the surface. You can see the Roofs Fault, which again is a known fault. And you can see you can actually extend these things and infer where they occurred um, outside of, 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 the, of their mapped extent. And so you can actually start to put a, um, a structural picture in terms of the formation of this basin and then the subsequent overprinting of the, of, of the basin, looking at the gravity and the existing structural data. And again, the deposits are associated with the gradients and commonly with some of these major faults, particularly the Rufus Fault. We actually look at the MT data, and this is an early diagram that Jing Ming provided um, about two years ago. And we can actually see that the light blue dots are strongly associated with the dark green zones. In this case, instead of looking for zones of, of conductivity, the deposits are actually associated with zones of low conductivity or resistive zones. So you can see, again, another geophysical data set which is kind of showing the same thing. Okay, now we're going to actually step away from um, nor northwestern um, Queensland and the no Northern Territory, and we're going to look at some other provinces around the world. And so we're actually going to go to the Northern Cordillera in uh, Alaska and Canada, and also going down into the countervenous uh, United States. And that is actually the second largest zinc province in the world. And it contains about 40 million tons of zinc, 15 million tons of, of uh, lead, and quite a bit of copper. Okay. And there are three types of zinc deposits. In this case, we have the shale host silicic clastic mafix and the shale host silicic clastic carbonate deposits, but we also have some VHMS deposits. And if you look at this diagram, you can see that the shale hosted deposits are near, near the boundary between the intermontane um, zone, which is shown in sort of the uh, beigey brown color, and the North American craton, which is shown in the light gray. So you can actually see that there's a reasonably good relationship with that. And the volcanic hosted mass of sulfide deposits are, are hosted further outboard. Okay. Now, if we actually look at the lead isotope map, and this is based on um, data sets um, provided by the USGS and also by the GSC, you can actually see there's a relationship, again, with a gradient um, in the mu values. Okay, and this is the mu values we're calculating the same way that we did in Mount Isa. And you can see that you have to the east, you have higher values, and then they become lower to the southwest. Okay, and you can actually see with the gradient between the sort of the, 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 the light purples and browns to the yellows, you actually, that's where the sediment hosted copper, uh, sediment hosted uh, lead zinc deposits are uh, located within. If you look at the VHMS deposits, they're associated more with more juvenile crust. So again, you're seeing that gradient, that boundary. So what about the other data sets? Well, here we have two of them. 
Okay, so the first one um, on the left shows the uh, relationship with the LAB. And this one is actually quite nice because you can see that the 170 kilometer um, depth is, is basically that nearly white, white line. And you can see that the sediment host deposits or shale host deposits are very strongly controlled that, and that applies to all of them. Okay, so that's consistent with what we saw in, in um, northern, no, northwestern Queensland. But also, if you look at the um, upward continued gravity data, it's not quite as clear, but if you look at those data, um, many of the deposits are actually associated with gradients within the upper continued gravity data. It's not one specific gradient, but it's a whole series of, of gradients and there are some quite significant ones uh, that you can see there. So the association with the LAB and the um, gravity gradients is also apparent in the North, uh, North America. We can actually look at this zone through here where the Canadians put a lithoprobe seismic profile. And this diagram so it kind of illustrates what's going on. So this has taken the interpretation of this, the, the, the seismic data and combined it with the uh, LAB data to actually provide a full cross section through from the cross into the upper mantle. And it shows you the distribution of the LAB, which you can see there. Now, the important thing is over here, approaching the 170 kilometer depth. The other thing important that you can see from this diagram is if you look to the um, east and you go west, you actually start to see the attenuation of the North Australia, um, North American craton, where you go from the dark blues and the light blues, and that progressively becomes thinner. And then you see the um, importance of the, of the yellow color. And that's, the, that's just showing the attenuation of that crust. Okay, if you actually look at the, the deposits associated with this transect, there's only one of it, and it's Sullivan, which actually sits slightly to the east of, of, of the section and actually would fit quite nicely onto the 170 kilometer um, LAB depth um, location. So we can see the seismic data, and also we see the same thing with the Australian seismic data. You can see there's a relationship between the deposits and various characteristics of, of, of the crust. Now we're gonna actually move to uh, Europe. In this case, we've only got lead isotopes. And what I'm gonna ask you is to concentrate on uh, Caledonian orogeny, and that uh, goes from um, Ireland up through Norway, and that's the light blues in the Northwest port portion of the map. And you can see it's a very juvenile uh, characteristics of the crust. We're gonna actually move into Ireland shown here, and we're gonna look at the next map. Okay, and this is the Irish Midlands um, province, and this is probably the third largest zinc province in the world. And again, there are three types of zinc deposits. There are carbonate hosted Irish type deposits. There's a few Mississippi Valley type deposits, and there's some volcanic hosted massive sulfites. But I've shown the location of the major deposits um, on that diagram in the sort of um, orange uh, spots, Tina, Navan, Silver Mines, Lachine, and Galloway. And you can see that those deposits are quite strongly associated with the gradient in mu. Okay, so you see, see that relationship with mu in three different major zinc provinces of the world. Okay, and so that's just basically what I said. And the other thing is that this gradient actually marks the boundary between the Caladonides and extends north northeast into northwest Scandinavia. So again, you're looking at some major boundary, an edge. Okay, and I'm gonna have, this is some data which just came off, off the press um, last week. Um, and we're gonna actually go to um, the Patterson province in Western Australia. And so what we have is Pilbara going to the Fortescue and into the Patterson province. And you can see there's a lot of variation in the mu values that you can see in, in the data. There's actually a quite strong gradient in the far east of this diagram, okay? So where you go from uh, the purples into the greens, and that's a very strong gradient in mu values. Uh, you're going from uh, 8.9 down to 8.4. That's a very, very strong gradient. And that gradient actually corresponds quite strongly with Vine's Fault, which is the um, western margin of the Patterson province. And if you actually look at the distribution of 
deposits, many of the deposits, the sediment host copper deposits, Nifty, um, and a few other ones are strongly associated with that gradient. Okay. But the other thing is if you go back to geophysical data and you use the geophysical data and, 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 and the interpretation of the uh, distribution of the uh, Pilbara craton at depth using geophysical data, you can actually see that that corresponds quite nicely to the gradient and also the volume's fault. So again, we're looking at an edge and it's controlling in this case, sediment hosts of copper deposits. So in terms of how you would go at, what does this indicate expiration wise? Well, it might indicate that there's expiration potential to the Northwest, um, under cover to the Northwest, under cover directly to the South and also potentially under cover to the Southwest or Southeast. So there's three potential indicators in terms of expiration potential you can use from this data. Okay, now I'm gonna actually talk about an evolution model. Okay, and this is based on what, we, what I've shown you before, but it's also based on seismic data that we collected, um, I think in 1995. Okay, so what we have is at about 1800 million years or before, we had actually three provinces which were juxtaposed in the North Australian zinc belt. And this goes approximately through the area of Mount Isa. Okay, so we had to the, to the west, we have the Aileron province. In the center, we have the Isa province. And to the east, we have the Numil uh, Kalanyala province. And so this is a structure that was set up um, prior to the de development of the zinc belt. Okay, and I'm gonna argue that the edge is actually the Rufus Fault, okay? We think that's what we're actually mapping with the, neo uh, with the lead isotopes and all the other data sets that we're looking at. Okay, so this is what we started out with. Okay, so you put extension between 1800 and 1680, you start forming what's called the Leichhardt uh, Super Basin, and you actually extend, and the extension is actually controlled by those bounding edges. Okay, so you get extension and you form uh, the Leichhardt Super Basin. Okay, and that includes basalts and some shallow water sediments. And in fact, we think that the, the basalts are the, the, the metal source. And so you have the deposition of that. And that's the initial extension to form this uh, zinc belt. You continue extension and you get what's called the Calvert Super Basin. And that's shown in, in, in the dark gray. And this is the Silicic Classic Mafic deposits. We're looking at um, turbidated sediments, deep water sediments, which are intruded and also have intercalated basalts within them. And this is where you form your siliciclastic mafic deposits. And these are early um, in, in, in the middlegenic evolution of this area. And that would include things like Cannington. Okay, so that's where we are. So we have deep water basin, coeval mafic magnetism, and the BHT mineralization. And again, this is actually controlled by the buttress of the Rufus Fault. Okay, if we continue on, then you actually eventually go to a risk, uh, you go to the SAG phase of basin development. Okay, so you actually start to form the shallow water risk SAG hosted deposits, the Mount Isa type uh, mineralization. And again, the basin is going to be localized on, uh, along that edge. So that edge is actually controlling the sedimentation and therefore the mineralization. Okay, so we can actually use this these data and these concepts will actually produce a uh, expiration indicators and actually where those expiration indicators and how far they are. So if you start at the bottom, you have the LAB, okay, and that can actually show you the 170 kilometer depth, but the uncertainty of those analyses indicate that you, you have to look for a couple of hundred uh, kilometers. That gives you a zone of a couple of hundred kilometers wide. Okay, if you go to the magnetotelluric data, um, you're looking at a slightly smaller zone, maybe 50 kilometers wide. If you go to the gravity data, you can actually look at that. And you can, again, you're looking at 50 kilometers wide. But if you look at complexities within that, the upper, the, the, um, the higher uh, wavelength uh, characteristics, you might actually be able to use the gravity data to zoom in maybe to 50 kilometers or, or even less in terms of of um, width, again, the gradients in mu, 
you go from high to low, again, you're looking at a 50 kilometer sort of things. And the thing is that it's horses for courses. It depends on what, what scale you're looking at, the, the, the tool that you use. So if you're looking at really big scale, like global scale, like what um, Mark, Hobart, Mark Hobart and, and Corral looked at, you're looking at a couple of hundred kilometers bandwidth. But if you're looking at much more um, detailed scales, where you've got good data, you can actually start to zoom in using gravity data and also the, the lead isotope data. So it just illustrates that there are different ways to map edges and that those edges can, uh, the precision of, the, of that mapping can improve using different data sets. Okay, now I'm gonna shift course, uh, shift courses quite a bit here and we're gonna talk about metal sources. I remember I talked about the Leichhardt Basin being the, 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 the source of metal uh, for these systems. And it's also um, partly the Calvert Basin, which will overlies it. And I'm going to talk about where the zinc and the copper came from. In this diagram, this is work mainly by David Champion, but I was uh, involved with it, just shows you um, the concentration of zinc versus potassium. So you link at uh, potassium alteration. In when you get to values of 10% K2O plus, and, and you're looking at the concentration of, of zinc within the basalt. And so the, the light green um, uh, box shows you the typical values of um, zinc in basalts. And if actually, if you look at the trends in the data, you can actually see a, a moderate zinc depletion trend with potassium loss, i.e. chloric alteration. In contrast, if you go to very high concentration of potassium, you have a strong zinc depletion. Okay, and we think this is actually quite important in terms of, of a, a source for zinc and, and other metals. Okay, so you have your potassium alteration, you're stripping out your zinc. Okay, if we look at copper, and this is showing uh, as, as a function of magnesium, so you're looking at chloride alteration. In this case, we have a general copper uh, depletion as compared to the, the, the green box, which shows you the typical uh, concentration of copper in, in, a, in a, a flood basalt. But you can also see a fairly reasonably good trend of copper depletion with chloride alteration. So copper seems to be coming out with chloride alteration, whereas your uh, zinc seems to be coming out with potassium alteration. So it's two different things uh, in terms of the styles of alteration. The interesting thing is we looked at cobalt too, and it shows that cobalt actually has a very similar characteristic to zinc, which kind of surprised us. We thought it would be the same as copper, but it's associated the same as zinc. So you see a depletion in cobalt associated with the potassium alteration. Okay, so we can actually look at this and map metal loss. And so if we split this into two groups, the younger volcanics, which are the Settlement Creek and the Gold Creek, um, volcanics and the older volcanics with the Seagull and Eastern Creek um, volcanics. Okay, if you actually look at this, you can actually start to see uh, you have a, a, at this diagram, if you're looking at magnesium and versus potassium, we have potassium alteration or uh, K feldspar alteration and it's associated with zinc loss. Then we have chloride K feldspar alteration. Up here, we have the same style of, of alteration. So again, your K-feldspar alteration with the zinc loss and the chloride K-feldspar association. And then finally, that chloride alteration, which seems to be only associated with the older volcanic sequences. So it's telling you something maybe that copper is being sourced slightly different from um, the, the zinc. Okay, so we actually take this and we look at the spatial distribution of, of, of the alteration assemblage. And this diagram here shows you um, on the left, the distribution of, of, of the various types of volcanic rocks. And, the, and on the right, the variation in the uh, potassium alteration. So the, the warm colors, the purples and the browns indicate potassium addition, whereas the uh, brighter colors, the greens and the yellows indicate potassium depletion. Okay, if we actually look at the distribution of the older volcanic rocks versus the younger volcanic rocks, you can actually see that the older volcanic rocks seem to be associated with potassium depletion, whereas the younger ones seem to be associated with potassium addition, i.e. zinc loss in this case. 
So you're probably getting the zinc from the K feldspar alteration associated with the zinc uh, with the zinc um, zinc loss. Okay, so that's just pointing out what I've said here. And we can actually look at that, and we can actually do some sums and some calculations. And uh, anyway, so you take that zone there, and then you blow that up, and you say, well, how big is this? You say it's 46,000 square kilometers surface area. Then you make an assumption of 500 uh, meters thickness. Um, and then you assume 50 ppm zinc loss is just about what we saw in the, in the diagram we had before. And you can actually calculate that about 1,600 million tons of zinc has been lost. Now, there's a, a lot of rubber in that number. But the important thing is it's much greater than the um, 100 million tons of, of, of zinc endowment. The other thing is that similar calculations can be applied for to copper. And there's not nearly as much copper in these systems as there is in zinc. So where is the copper gone to? So are we looking at a potential uh, copper province? Um, so now the last thing I'm going to talk about is the response of this alteration to um, of, of, of the of the alteration to magnetic susceptibility. Okay, so this diagram shows magnetic susceptibility plotted against magnesium, copper, and zinc. And so if you look at the, the, the purple colored um, circles there, it shows the least altered samples. Okay, so they're relatively susceptible. They have relatively high um, max, uh, copper concentrations and relatively high zinc concentrations. But if you start to alter this thing, you can actually alter it in that direction. So you increase the magnesium, you decrease the copper, and you decrease the zinc. And then finally, when you get really low magnetic susceptibility, you actually ex really extend the uh, magnesium enrichment, but you also strip out all the base metals. So we can actually see the, the, the results of this alteration in the magnetic susceptibility um, data. So we actually take this and we actually look at an area through here. And this is um, showing a, a blow up and the magnetic, the total magnetic intensity image. And you can see uh, that there's a bit of uh, differences in the characteristics of the signal. The, the dark um, black line shows the extent of the Siegel volcanics outcrop. But if you look at that, there's actually a variation in the characteristics of magnetic susceptibility. Okay, so the magnetic uh, Siegel uh, volcanics, so this is probably your typical Siegel volcanics, which are unaltered. But if you look at demagnetized Siegel volcanics, um, that's potentially um, where you're seeing that alteration. So that's your metal source shown in, the, in that subdued magnetic signature. And the important thing is down here, um, is one of the major prospects in, in, in the area which is currently being explored. So the last, second to last slide is the current EFTF, uh, NDI, and CMI and MI activities associated with shale-hosted uh, zinc deposits. And so Jean Clotier and Ariane Ford and some other people are looking at national scale mineral potential mapping on shale-hosted deposits. I think that's being released today or yesterday. Also, there's um, basin geochemistry looking at the Adelaide uh, Rift Complex and the Stewart Shelf. And this is what David Champion is doing currently uh, with the Afghani and a few others. Um, we're also looking at critical minerals in zinc deposits, specifically germanium, gallium, and indium. And that's I'm doing that with the Afghani. And then um, there's a big program which will be kicking off fairly soon uh, at NDI drilling in the Patterson province. And so we're looking at, in, those, in that case, sediment-hosted copper deposits, but I think it also has implications for sediment, potential for sediment-hosted zinc deposits. So a summary, edges seem to be the controls on the distribution of zinc deposits in three of the world's largest zinc provinces. These edges can be mapped using a range of data sets, and I won't go read those out. And the results from one data set may provide the impetus to assess the other data sets.
like for instance, the lead isotopes provided the impetus to look at the LAB. The lead isotopes in the LAB looked at the impetus to, 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 to look at the gravity data sets, et cetera, et cetera. The North Australian basin system has been extensively altered and you've had extensive metal loss, particularly in the Leichhardt and Calvert Super Basin. This metal more than accounts for the endowment of the North Australian zinc belt and highlights potential for copper and zinc and, and cobalt deposits. The alteration associated with metal loss may be mappable using gravity uh, uh, regional magnetic data. And then finally, I've given up a really wide ranging talk using a whole bunch of different data sets. And I think it's, it's the culture here at GA that allows this. Um, because it allows me and, and colleagues like David Champion and, and Michael Dublier and others to actually follow our nose and sort of follow the investigation, see what they happen. And it leads to the integration of the data sets that we've got, which actually reinforce themselves and actually give us more confidence in our interpretations and more confidence in the utility of their applications. Okay, thank you. <laughs>